All right, so I'll give you another example. So, so, so in the end, now, see, look at here. In our text, he will say that all, would you please, let's go back to 132. See? 130. This is very important because this is the part of a lot of people don't understand about economics, basic economics, and that's why they misunderstand Marx. <coughs> so he said, page 132, he said, essentially it's a question of land economy, the land that's in the middle of the last paragraph, the land. Land can be regarded as a natural instrument of production. Then on the other hand, then we call page Page, page uh, 133, the beginning at the bottom line. All right, that, let's, let's go. Oh, please, would you, oh, you have a different edition. Uh, that, 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 Darren, would you please read that page 132? Land was, can be regarded after that. Um, no, no, this is, no, here arises, that sentence begins, here arises the difference between natural instrument of production and those created by a civilization. Okay. Um. Here arises the difference between natural instruments and production and those created by civilization. See, in other words, natural instruments are the land economy, because land is naturally there. But on the other hand, the capital, factories, and all those are created by civilization. Go on. The land, water, etc., can be regarded as a natural instrument of production. In the first case, with the natural instrument of production, individuals are subservient to nature. In the second, to a product of labor. That is, if when you work in a land economy, you are subservient to nature. But if you work in a factory, you are subservient sub 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 to human product. That's a factory, right? Go on. In the first case, property, land and property, appears as direct natural domination. In the second, as domination of labor, particularly of accumulated labor, capital. The first case presupposes that the individuals are united by some bond, family, tribe, the land itself, etc. Then he says if when, we, when people worked on landed property in the land economy, even the social organization is natural because it's a family bond, the whole family worked it. Yeah, go on. The second case presupposes that they are independent of one another and are only held together by exchange. Look at what, when you go into the factory world is no longer natural unit of family. They are simply there by simply exchange relation. Go on. In the first case, the exchange is mainly an exchange between men and nature in which the labor of men is exchanged for the products of nature. In the second, it is predominantly an exchange of men among themselves. In the first yeah, that's, that's it. So we have this whole exchange going on between men and nature, but in the other case, it's really between human beings and human beings, one company against another. And let's gain the concept of reproductive, reproductive forces. So the reproductive whole question of free flow, free economy. And I'll give you one example to illustrate this point. All right, Jonathan, allow me listen carefully, all right? Okay. Here's way back about 10 what? About 15 years ago, when, when Eastern Europe was just being opened, a friend of mine, the American studies, went to New York, uh, uh, Poland, and he found something very startling. He, when, he, when he went to a, a restaurant, in a hotel restaurant, and he was there, and there were only not, it was catering primarily to foreign visitors, and there were only a few handful of people, and huge restaurant, dining table, wonderful dining table, and lo and behold, there are only three or four, five, five, three or four guests, but about 20 waiters were standing at attention. 20 of them. Two serve only three or four guests. On the other hand, when he steps just one block outside, there's a grocery store, and there's only one clerk serving about 200 people lined up in line. This is what I mean. That's obviously irrational distribution of human resources, is it not? Absolutely. What do you mean that's what you mean? <laughs> you have 20, 20 people serving three people, and here's one clerk serving 200 people? Hmm. That's inefficient. The why couldn't they, in other words, would that happen in a, in a bourgeois economy? No. They cannot support 20 waiters by serving three guests. But it can be supported in socialist economy. 
because they don't have to worry about the bottom line, profit and loss. And suppose, imagine, American grocery store is <coughs> only one clerk, checkout counter for 200 people waiting there. Would they come there? They would not. So in other words, the whole personality is never allowed to flow from the higher to a lower level. In other words, in a free market, in other words, that 20 waiters would not be standing there, no tension at all. The personnel will be demanded, you know, that will be demanded for each factory and they will hire as many as they need. But in a, in a socialist economy, they don't do that. You know how they do it? They simply decide, come on, we are, we, are, we are a factory, right? I'm sending you 200 guys. Why? Because I got 200 guys. I have to get rid of them. So you get 200 guys, whether you need them or not. This is called a command economy. That is the supply and demand and that fixes the whole capitalism. And Milton Friedman's famous example is the spencer. I, I, was, I saw that one lecture, so this one I do you know here's a simple penalty. Do you know how many factories stages of production goes into making that one pencil? Do you know by that argument? I was startled. It goes through two hundred companies. You, if you want to count where the lead is made, the wood was made, and the metal was made, and the dye was made, and goes on. 200 companies. And 200 companies, each of them will be determined by the supply and demand of each company. But what do you do in a command economy? That 200 company decisions should be made by the centrally located plant. And that's tough to do. That's fantastic one. That's tough. Um, yeah. how, how would you respond, though, to some uh, Marxist critic who objects that the uh, use of labor resources in capitalist economies is seriously inefficient in certain respects? I mean, it takes 20 people just to keep Jennifer Lopez together from one day to the next. <laughs> um, you know, Plus. You're you're rich capitalist, or yeah. you know, you're wealthy yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. individual in yeah. a capitalist society yeah. Yeah. Um, does not make efficient use yeah. of uh, products of labor. Who was say that? Now, happen, you know, I have, do you know, I have 20, 20, 10, 20 servants. I don't need them, but I have them. Therefore, it's inefficient. What would you say if you're economist? It's not, it's not inefficient with respect to the ends of the society Right. Oh, the question is why? Right, but then that's the no, point. No, 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 Efficiency no, no, becomes no, no, relevant. No, no, no. you, you guys are wrong, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you are doing wrong things. You don't know your damn economics. <laughs> <laughs> the only question you have to ask is, does he pay those guys? Those 20 servants. And she pays. He pays. So it contributes to the GMP. That's what was in the GMP. That's efficient yeah. enough. That's what he's On the other hand, if you were to keep the 20 guys, and I'm not going to pay you guys because you are not doing any damn thing at all, then that's not efficient. This is no, but instead of having the servants, they could give their money to poor people. Oh, I mean, that's, yeah. that's the idea. Yeah, I mean. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but poor people does not have to really produce any efficiency at all. Right. Not at all. But the point I'm making then is that yeah. efficiency um, is not an absolute concept that it, it, it's relativistic. It no, no. And what it is you're trying to maximize. No, we, we are talking trying to about maximize GMP. That we are talking about economic do. efficiency. That's all there. In fact, this is this is kind of like your story. Do you realize, you know, he has billions of money. Do you know it will be much more efficient instead of it enjoying two billion if he spreads out to two billion people? You know why? Because, because here's the story. See, suppose you have a dollar, and so you you has two billion, right? Friend has that, friend has that, two billion. How much you utility crunch of people I get out of it? Just a little bit, very tiny. 
But if you give it to a guy who's starting from hunger, how much is he will get this much pressure? So if he spreads out the two billion dollars, the two two billion, well, I say say not two billion, two billion, and the hungry people, whole pressure will become much more efficient. That's called utilitarian efficiency. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about sheer economic efficiency. Yep. And if we, can, we can very well say that the two billion dollars being hoarded is really utilitarian perspective is inefficient. And, and actually, I think Marx is agreeing that, that capitalism is incredibly efficient economic. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, you, yeah. there is no other side yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. But judged from that one own criteria, Marx is on the same page as Milton Friedman. Okay, but um, I don't know about that economics, so I'm prepared to be hungry <laughs> or, or even mocked here. But um, doesn't it depend on your definition of wealth? Um, my feeling would be my sort of um, schooled and naive mm -hmm. objection to a lot of economic thinking would be that they're operating with a very narrow definition of wealth. Yeah, but if you broaden the meaning yeah. of economic, I mean, if you invested in those two people, yeah, there has to be market they for yeah. anything to do with money. So you're, you're presupposing equality over what, what you're right. marketing. Yeah. I don't know if you want my question or not. Yeah. Hold, hold on a second. You know, the wealth is you kind of say that. Look at this pressure. Although it's there on the other side, this is really a kind of wealth too. After all, the more pleasure people have, the wealth we have, more wealth we have. Surely that's true. You can define wealth any way you want. No, but he's also saying that you'd have a greater GNP. You'd have a larger GNP. No, no, no. That, that, that doesn't follow. No, that doesn't follow. <laughs> that, that's going to follow. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. My question is very simple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Given that Marx thinks that capitalism is very efficient economically, why does he then think that communism is going to also be efficient economically? Yeah, hold on, that we'll talk about later, you know? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that will talk about later. <laughs> I told you you weren't going to like it. Yeah, no, 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 that we'll talk about it, we have a reason. Right. In fact, in fact, communism cannot be efficient because it does not employ supply demand. Right. This is why. Right. That is, it has to be controlled by the central plan. You have to decide, you have to send out. And, and I'll tell you another interesting point. So communism can guarantee full employment. Do you know there's no reason why they should be jobless people? Because you assign the people to back. Right? What happened to fishing in the morning and hunting in the afternoon? Oh, that, no way, no way. Yeah. That, was, that was only, by the way, that's, a, that's called communist utopia. That means that's when you no longer have to work because all the production, that, all the labors will be done by machines and so on, and you will be a free man. So that's, a, that's a different proposition. It's not, right. it's not yet. Okay. Well, isn't that, though, in one sense, if, maybe this is perhaps a false understanding I have mm -hmm. from before, but the difference between socialism and communism yes. has, is supposed yeah. to be that the communism yeah. is the true, you, true utopia where there really isn't even yeah. central authority and you don't need one. Yeah. You've gone beyond right. the point of yeah. socialism. Yeah. So really socialism is next and that does have centralized. Well, then why is Marx so critical of the anarchists? Yes. Because that, I mean, he's talking about an anarchy uh, yeah. position and, yeah. and why is he so critical of the anarchists? He absolutely belittles any kind of political, I mean, throughout this, he yeah. speaks disparagingly yeah. of princes and states. Yeah. As if they're entirely superb. Oh, okay. Anyway, and let's not consider about the future utopia yet because we are just talking about the present, the past. Don't you remember? Capitalism, how it emerges. And in capitalism, they say everything demanded, so we cannot really loyalty. And look at again. Then, then he said, another important thing is really, is really freedom for capitalism. You see, this is exactly the whole idea of freedom. Okay. Suppose the serfs stay on with their feudal law. I am loyal to it. We don't want to leave it. And the same way, you know, I get, I get fired because they are laid off. Then I want to be loyal to my factory. I won't seek any job with any other company. That will be destroyer. See, that's terrible. That will destroy capitalism. So the laborers should try to seek as high a wage as possible, and for that you have that freedom. freedom of movement, freedom of employment. So, so now you see you're changing the world. 
The kind of things the people you have done, oh, I am going to really give up this factory because I'm going to pay me five dollars more an hour, that would have been considered a disloyal. That's a terrible thing. But now we have to celebrate it. No, we never use the word destroyer, and this we call a oh, glory of liberty, free enterprise. This is the trend, this is the trend. what Nietzsche would later call transvaluation of values. This is, by the way, this is very hard for us to imagine because the fact that, do you know, do you know one change the employer? The other day I was talking about with my, our faculty members here. You know, we no longer have institutional loyalties. Why? Because as soon as another university offers a little, a little bit of salary, you just jump. In the olden days, we never thought of doing it because we were so loyal to our institution. It's true. This is why, you know, even right up a few years ago, many Japanese corporations, they always said, we never lay off people. Don't you remember? Lifetime guarantee? Right. That was out of old loyalty. And a week ago, I saw a special, wonderful TV, PBS show on, on the travails and pains that Chinese people are going through for the liberalization of their economy. Oh, sure. And, and, and one of the first people they interviewed was a woman who worked in a state factory for 20 years. And she said, we never, when I was working for the past 20 years, we never thought of life outside this factory because my life was quite this factory. But now what? They say I may be fired any minute. And he said, this is stinking, this is disgusting. He says, how can you treat your loyal servant like that? But then another interesting that came up in the Chinese that example was that in the olden days, you remember I just said, after all, state own the companies, there's no profit to loss at all. Because after all, uh, materials, resource, source materials, resources they get from state and finished their product will return to state. But the Chinese, as soon as they started doing it, every factory has to keep on account of cost and profit. And any factory that's not going to come out of red will be closed. Pain. And that's why, by the way, the idea of freedom of, of every worker to seek their best compensation, it looks like a wonderful idea, but at the same time, and you don't realize what a terrible anxiety, uncertainty it has introduced to the working class. And mind you, that anxiety is not only the workers, it affects the owners of these people too. Why? Because again, in a feudal economy, you never have the danger of losing that your, your feudal land unless it's invaded. But any of these companies can go back from any time. There's no security. And that's why bourgeoisie capitalism is the really economy of perpetual competition, is really perpetual war. War of one, everybody against everybody else. And the city economy, the condition. And the next point I want to introduce before we adjourn is the important part. The important part is the expansion. You remember I told you with a landed economy, this is what I said. It, it's, but on the other hand, the whole IBM, this market is never fixed. It can shrink the small, or it can engulf everybody else. Expand it all the time. That expansion is built in, in market economy. So expansion is built in, and look at, look at the whole idea of nationalism. In the nationalism, German nationalism, Greek nationalism, do you know, <coughs> all of you know, Germany was one man, was not a nation until 19th century. Bismarck comes along in the second half of 19th century. Before that, there was a bunch of the feudal state. So you have a bunch of the feudal state, and here's a one, here's a, the same way. You remember, I just grew up, and here, a bunch of the states, they come up, and many students stay there, and each of them has is a tag there. Here's a tag of values. No free market. But as I said before, 
free market really essential builds in their their expression. Also, yeah, here's a company cannot simply operate only one small huge thing. It has to go up. It has to go up because the eventually the whole nation state becomes the whole market. The unity of the whole unification of Germany was empowered by the expansion of capitalism. And do you know when we were reading the last chapter of Sugar's book, I said this one, do you, do you realize there's something funny going on? So he starts out talking about reformation, then he introduces you the notion of emergence of nation state. But he never connects the two. What the heck they have to do with it? And here's Marx of come. I'm telling you that the emergence of the nation state has nothing to do with the reformation. It's the manifestation of capitalism. So if the nation state comes along, and then what happens? The whole nation is not the whole nation. That's not enough. Because then here's a plan, and here's the England. And what they do? They have to go out to the whole world. This is so-called imperial. See, European imperialism of the 19th century is never militaristic. Primary is commercial. Look at a small country like Dutch, control entire Indonesia. And when English English people came to India, they didn't bring with a big army. They had one trading company, East India Trade. It's uh, inconceivable that kind of appearance. Is it purely economic? The nation state comes along, and what happened? Then here's the that then France, they won't have their own market. But France is a whole big, fair big company. Germany is a very big, big nation by the time they unify. Then Dutch is a surely small. But even smaller than Belgium, they had their, their own colonies in, 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 in Africa. Did you know? Even Portugal, <laughs> that smallest country, they had it too. And then they go to a home they go home company. And by the way, by the time they Engulf the entire world. Look at the British colony empire. The sun never sets on Her Majesty's empire. That's Queen Victoria. Then they come and become. It's a German government and France, and then they have the Britain, and that conflict between imperial territory, imperial market, is really the outbreak of the World War One. World War One is principally the fight for the world market. All right, let's, let's consider this whole idea of nation state and all that stuff. And that comes up here. That comes up. Could you please look at page, page 136. And here comes, comes that map. Uh, would you please read page 136, the bottom paragraph? Oh, I have a different sure. Yeah. Okay, Andre, you read that one. Where is it? What, what, what? Bottom what paragraph, one, one, yeah. Uh, the middle, in the middle? No, the, the, in the second paragraph. It depends? Yeah. It depends entirely on the extension of commerce, whether the first production of forces Especially inventions in a locality are lost for later. Originally, look at it. So the extension of commerce means that originally the productivity is confined to the localities, provincial locality, but it can't stay there because it has to expand. Go on, next paragraph. As long as there is no commerce. No, next paragraph. Oh, I'm sorry. A direct consequence of the division of labor between the various towns was the rise of manufacturers branches of production that have developed So here we have the whole production or rise from towns, but initially you remember in the town, do you know when they had a guild? It was not free market. Why? Because guild membership was limited, entry is restricted. And the price they can charge was also set by the feudal law. Yeah. It was never free market. Although the guild and town was the origin of capitalism, but it was not free. Okay, let's let's move down to, would you please look at uh, uh, Andrea at the, the bottom paragraph. Um, that kind of labor which from the beginning required a machine, even of the crudest kind, 
soon turned out to be most capable of development. Weaving, previously done by peasants in the country, was a secondary job to provide clothing, was the first labor to receive an impetus, and a further development through the extension. So this is an example. Look at the weaving. Weaving was done in the olden days by peasant, every peasant as a part of their family life. But as soon as it becomes commerce, because it becomes one of the biggest industries. That's one example. All right, then let's move on. Page 137, the bottom paragraph. With rise of manufacturing, the various industries that have Nations entered into a competitive relationship, the fight for trade, which was fought out in wars, protective duties, and prohibition. And this is what I talk about. See, before, you see, before, before the nation state emerges, the convention and the feudal guilds and feudal towns were restricted only to the province. But as soon as it becomes a, a capitalism, it just breaks open all the barriers. Originally, the feudal Europe, she talks about the whole barrier of tariffs, protective duties, prohibition. That was now, she talked about in terms of national boundary, but originally it was on the boundary of feudal law, feudal state, estate. Every feudal estate had a, had a protective barrier. But now every nation is built up, builds up the whole protective barrier for their own industries. Go on. Why? The nation. Well, the nation. He, he talked about nation states, all right? Nation. Formerly, formerly had carried on an inoffensive exchange if they were in contact at all. From then on, trade assumed political significance. Yeah. All right, Connor, you read the next paragraph. Um, the relationship between worker and employer also changed. In the guilds, the patriarchal relationship between journeyman and master continued to exist. In manufacturing, the monetary relation between worker and capitalist took its place, a relationship which retained a patriarchal tinge in the country and the small towns, but quite early lost almost all patriarchal coloration in the larger, the real manufacturing towns. Yeah, look, look at that, that, that is a, in the guild world, in the medieval world, the relation of the employer, employed is all hierarchical, is fraternal, is fraternal, is really like a family relation, but that idea of family relation, emotional attachment, is just completely gone. By the way, the breaking up of the emotional attachment is very important for promoting the freedom of workers. The free individual cannot be free if he has emotional attachment. It's like 47 groaning. If I'm attached to this factory, to this owner, so I cannot really move simply for a higher paid wage, he's enslaved by emotion. Come on, Carl, isn't that a good point? Now, yeah. he's saying that one of the most difficult obstacles against free mobility is the emotional thing. So culture is emotion? That's part of your culture to have? Exactly, that's the holy culture. That so is a... Culture equals emotion. For culture, by the culture is built on emotion. There's no culture without emotion. All those values simply, as long as these values remain your cerebral affair, cold ideas, it doesn't have any force at all. Only when it becomes emotional, it really has the power to bind you. Just imagine, Kana, suppose you want to ditch your girlfriend. You can't do that if you are emotionally attached to her. <laughs> <No. laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is the wonderful point, you know. You, you have. This is why, if you, if you talk about that, you talk about the medieval field, the relation of a master and the journeyman, this is like the parent and children, very warm and cordial. But on the other hand, if you go to this idea, there's no cordial relation between owner and employer. In fact, you never get to know the owner anyway, because the owners themselves are totally personal stockholders. Shareholders. But if you even talk about your boss, he may not be owner, but there's no emotional relation of that wonderful relation of the evil kind between the between the, your sector chief and your yourself as an employee. You know that. I, I think they actually try to you <coughs> complicated. So you are less reluctant to leave. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a key. that's an abuse of this emotional time, isn't it? 
Yeah, 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 I tell you, yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what happened. Okay, okay, Kano, would you please, now, this is very interesting, but now here, here nation states is still important. Let's read, pay attention to nation states. Go on, Kano, let's read that. Manufacturing, yeah. Manufacturing and the movement of production in general received an enormous stimulus through the extension of commerce with the discovery of America and the sea route in the East Indies. The new products imported from America and the Indies, particularly the large quantities of gold and silver which came into circulation, completely changed the position of classes toward each other and dealt a hard blow to feudal landed property and laborers. The expeditions of adventurers, colonialization, and above all, the extension of markets into a world market. Okay. The world market, that's important, right? Yes. Now possible and becoming more and more a fact of each day called forth a new phase of historical development, which we cannot further discuss here. Through the colonization of newly discovered lands, the commercial struggle of nations against one another received new fuel and thus became bigger and more. Here comes the struggle of one nation of each other. And that nation or national struggle was on behalf of uh, the bourgeoisie. Don't, don't you know the old? There was, there was a long series. Kind of, did you see there was a, that long previous series of civil war? Did you see that? Ken Burns. You know, the civil, civil war. Yes. Civil war. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 Do you know what a wonderful uh, phrase I picked up from there? Uh, he says, in the war, he talk about it. He says, poor man's combat, rich man's war. But other than the poor man's combat, rich man's war. The poor guys go out there and come back, get killed. But in the meantime, the rich man make big money from war. Now, fantastic. You can see that, that, you know, that poor man's come back. And that was a popular phrase during the Civil War, I, I was told. Rich man's war. And, 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 and where we are contemplating this war against Iraq, I don't know how it's going to be. But way back when there was a big bombing on Indo, Indo China and, and it, Cambodia, one day I was watching with my little kids. And she, she was chosen. Huge P-52 goes over, dropping just tons of bombs. Girl, our children were so scared. So I said, well, don't get scared. Do you know, by the way, how much each of those bombs cost to make? He said, I found that a staggering amount. Each bomb cost over a million dollars. And who makes money? Of course, the guys who <laughs> make, make money or not. <laughs> So, so, so these guys are, you know, using a skill, but on the other hand, uh, if you are rich capitalist, every bomb drop, you say, God, I made hundreds of dollars. <laughs> I, I'm assuming that 10% profit of each bomb, one million dollars, hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice to see that he, <laughs> to drop hundreds of dollars in my pocket? <laughs> every cloud is a silver lining. Huh? Every cloud is a silver lining. Oh, it's more than silver, it's gold. Like, that's a silver. Can I? Would you please read the uh, last paragraph now? Me? Yeah. Um, expansion of. The no, page. during the epoch. No, no, the last oh, paragraph. The last paragraph on the page. Yeah, Sorry. last paragraph. During the epoch under discussion, the relationships of the nations to one another took on two different forms. Again, the relation of nation against another nation. All right, go on. In the beginning, the small quantity of gold and silver in circulation brought about a ban on the export of these metals. Industry, mostly imported from abroad and needed to employ the increasing urban population, required those privileges which could be granted not only against competition at home, but mainly against foreign competition. Look, here is, a, here is a whole resistance against foreign competition. It's very important. Yeah? Go on. In the original prohibitions, the local guild privilege was extended over the whole nation. Customs duties originated from levies which feudal lords exacted as protection money from merchants passing through their territories and from levies later imposed by towns as the most convenient method of raising money for their treasury. 
Yeah, we see the whole idea of this tariffs and all that, the protection was a feudal practice, but that was carried over, magnified by the nationalist state by the time bourgeoisie became a big money maker. All right, that was again tariff, then goes on. Then let's look at now, okay, kind of, would you please go to next page, next paragraph. Second period? Yeah. The second period began in the middle of the 17th century and lasted almost to the end of the 80s. Commerce and navigation had expanded more rapidly than manufacturing, which played a secondary role. Colonies were becoming important customers. After long struggles, the individual nations shared the opening world market. This period begins with the navigation laws and colonial monopolies. Competition of the nations among themselves was excluded so far as possible by tariffs, prohibitions, and treaties. In the last resort, competitive struggle was carried out and decided in wars. That produced the war, the competition by nation against nation. The most uh, yeah. That's, that's enough. I know. That's, that's the whole story, all right? This is the, this is the, the expansion. So now you can see how expansion. Let's talk about this expansion. So expansion is like from the from the smaller whole country, and whole country is not big enough. So whole world, whole world is not big enough. So if I hope it's expansion. Now consider the talk we had last time about American civil war. Okay, come again. I'm going to come back again. Civil war. And I said, you remember. By the principle of liberty, southern states had every right to receive if they didn't like to stay in the Union. Didn't I say that? But now try to see this context. So if you to look at it, you know, from the abstract political right, they simply say theoretical. Yeah, there is, you know, you know, after all, southern states had a right to receive if they want to. But Lincoln wanted to preserve the Union. If you put it that way, it doesn't really explain why the war had to take place. But if you put it in the context of this expansionism, it makes perfect sense. Why? Because southern states were the ranch and real company. It's a land economy divided into section. On the northern states are states of the bourgeois capital. So we had to expand. Then just imagine that if heaven, if the northern state didn't win and southern states survived, they won, then what? America would have been right. The whole history would have been different. Because then would be a setback to capitalism. And what would have become? American country would become just like South America. What's the difference between South America and North America, Central America? There are so many countries in South America. It's a vulgarization. As long as they are divided into small, small countries which have had to protect its own self, it can never give rise to a huge industrial power which America has now. Now you see that point? This is the difference. Yes? Well, I was just going to say about the, um, you know, the the idea that imperialism caused wars or this expand this this capitalist expansion into other territories yeah. caused wars. Yeah. I really think there's another step. It's okay. more how how the nations perceive their interests that caused the wars rather than the actual well, empirical fact of Well you know, Marx Marx is talking about the imperial fact. Yeah, that let's talk right about that point that later. Right. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about your point later because we are just running out of time. But what is amazing is that Marx was writing in 1940s, and World War One did not take place until when? 19. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. That's fantastic foresight. But look at the American expansionism. American expansionism was always there well before the Civil War. Where? In the Federalist debate. Federalists want to have a strong union. And the Republicans, the Virginians, they want, do not want to have that strong union. The kind of thing they were thinking about was like a European Union. Independent state, 13 states. See, and that is already in their union making. 
But that's not the only thing. But if you look at the civil war, the expansion is not simply north and south. Why? Because that expansion, more important thing, was taking place from east to west. That's testified by the whole expansion to the west. Look, look, look at, look at the, look at the idea of Homestead Act. Homestead Act was passed in 16, uh, 1862, right in the middle of the Civil War. That was to encourage all white Americans to move to West to get 160 acres for only ten dollars. And that's the time we realized whole tra transcontinental railroad was laid. That was again the middle of the Civil War. And to do that, they have to chase out all the Native Americans, the Cheyennes. So when you look at you know this whole thing, Cheyenne get chased out. They were chased way up to the Black Hills, and they or they go. They just had to move all the time because they move one too long time. They say, "Oh, we found one of gold mine, so you gotta move, move up, move up, chase out, chase out all the time." And American Civil War was lauded as a war of liberty. Liberty for what? Liberty for the exploitation of the poor people. Liberty to get, get the, kick out the Native American. Why? Because by doing so, by demolishing the southern slavery system, it frees the market. You remember the previous slaves become free laborers. Right? And uh, that was a truly really ironic because after all, Emancipation Proclamation of Emancipation, that was not issued at the beginning of the Civil War, only later, just to encourage, you know, the, to help the winning of the war, because that was not the foremost on their mind. At the same time, do you know, during the, right in the middle of the Civil War, 19, 1863, the, the Native Americans who were getting chicks, the chased out, the she Cheyenne, they sent their delegation to President Lincoln. Begged there, his uh, for himself, he didn't care at all. So the whole story of American Civil War as a war of liberation is not there at all. If you look at the whole whole idea of the whole background of the Civil War, so in the end, it was really the war of expanding capitalism, and mind you, South had no chance whatsoever because after all. Every time capitalism goes into an agrarian world, it always wins. But a lot of the European wars, I think, were about political power. What? As much in, polit in, in, in expanding sovereignty in a political sense, as much as a, the ones that took place in Europe on European soil were, were about political power as much as. Of course, after all, that I told you that those nations did <coughs> war against each other in Europe. But it's sometimes well, territorial. The territorial is territorial expansion was needed for the expansion of the market. That's what I was saying. You know, I'm not saying that the war among the nations fought only on the world stage. In fact, it took place already in Europe, long time ago. And they really expanded into worldwide economy, and by doing so, they found an outlet. All right. So I'm not saying that they didn't fight against each other. In fact, the fighting among the nation states began way back in the 17th and 18th century, 19th century. The Franco, Frank, the Bismarck's war, that Franco, Frank, Franco, Joe, for the Prussian war, that was a classical example, right there. Yeah, would you please, by the way, I don't, I cannot go into details or all this stuff, but it, just have in mind this idea of expansionism, nationalism, for a long time go together, because nation state provide the market. This is why, do you know, one of the strongest enemies, number one, enemy number one for Marx is capitalist. Number two is a nationalist, because nationalist is a natural law of capitalism. That's the dirtiest word for, for, for Marx and England. Anybody who's a nationalist is a betrayer, traitor of, of a proletariat. For this reason. All right, then would you please do me a favor, see? This is the background you are going to need for understanding, for understanding uh, communist method. When you read it, 
And uh, my advice is that the really heart of the whole thing, manifesto, there are two kinds of games, you see, about the communist utopia, that's one thing, but before he gets to it, he will be talking about the whole world history that led up to the whole predatory, uh, uh, fight of proletariat, and that's section one, bourgeoisie and proletariat, and this is the heart of the whole lot. By the way, this was written only three years after German ideology, so that means Marx was only 40 years old, and Engels was only 27. That's amazing. 28. Yeah, 28, and that's right. So I, can I teach them, and my students, do you realize? Shame on you. You have to be good. Time to get educated. Well, to me, it seems naive, so it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. He, he's a, I'm telling you, he's a, his communism, I, utopia, that's really naive. But his understanding of capitalism, nationalism, there's no yeah, better. I mean, look at people like Mill, who wrote at the same time. I mean, who had a very buoyant view of society. Yeah, but Mill never gave account of capitalism. Mill never gave account of capitalism, especially in Well, he used Marx's method of capitalism. Well, she talks, she talks really freedom as though it's a holy cow, you know. That's what freedom is great, that's all he says. But no, he, he, <laughs> he never says there you how he is. On liberty. Yeah, on liberty, yeah. On liberty in yeah. one sentence. Yeah, he just says, he's a holy cow, you call him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, read the Great Reset. Yeah. It's, I like that. Reset. What? The Great Reset. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, his accounts, where he responds to. I don't know what else to say.